webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we will get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinars page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to Abby to go ahead and kick off today's presentation. Take it away. Thank you, Christy. And hello all. Uh, this is Abhi. So today we are going to cover uh, using Qbert in telcos. Right. Before we begin. All right, so uh, about myself, uh, I'm an author, speaker, and blogger. I'm an open source contributor. I work primarily in a Linux Foundation uh, Edge project called Acrino. And uh, I will be taking case study from uh, Acrino Edge Stack. And I'm working as DMTS, which is Distinguished Member of Technical Staff in uh, CTO 5G team in Wipro. All right, so uh, here's the agenda for today. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to start with the uh, current challenges in telco, especially from uh, VNF and CNF hosting perspective. And then after going through the challenges, we will see how does Qbert fits and how does Qbert helps in uh, addressing some of those challenges, right? So that way I will be summarizing what role Qbert is going to play in telco world. And after that, we will see a, a case study on uh, Qbert, like how does it actually work, right? And it will have a set of steps, lessons, and uh, at the end, we will have a key takeaways where I will summarize on uh, current Qbert uh, status and from telco perspective, right? And uh, that will be the key message from this presentation. All right, so let's get started. Uh, from current challenges perspective. Okay, so uh, the first one is uh, legacy applications are not going to go away very soon, right? Now, though cloud native uh, computing adoption is growing at a very fast pace, but uh, there are situations like uh, uh, applications uh, which can't be containerized because either there is no source code or maybe they're, they're not architected for containers. And in many cases, they are using some proprietary OS. It could be from telco vendor or from some, somewhere else, or maybe some operating system, which is not supported uh, in container world, right? So this is one of the category of legacy application, which can't be containerized. And second category is uh, non-replaceable legacy apps, right? So though everyone, if, if there is a legacy app which can't be containerized, then uh, the next logical conclusion is that why not uh, replace it with something modern, right? And something which is cloud native and, and maybe the upgraded version of the application and so on. But uh, in few cases, uh, there are applications which can't be replaced either because they are like 20 years old, even they are given from a small vendor which is no more present. Right? So there could be several scenarios. So uh, the summary from this slide is that uh, legacy applications will be there. I mean, having 100% cloud native world is uh, kind of myth. Now, uh, second challenge is about VNF, right? So though everyone, so before we get into VNF, uh, let me first cover what is VNF and CNF. So, it all started from PNF, right? Which is physical network function. So in uh, telco world, uh, you have all kind of network function, right? Uh, some, something like firewall, routers, those are very commonly used network functions. And earlier they were present in terms of appliance, right? And they were called phys uh, PNF, physical network function, right? Now the challenge with PNF was, uh, they were very difficult to scale. So if you want to scale it, you have to buy more appliances and you have to manage it uh, individually, right? Because they, they were like all in a box kind of uh, solution. 
right? And then came VNF, which was virtual network function, right? Where the hardware and software uh, segregation was done, right? So then, uh, so let's say if it is firewall, then firewall was given as VNF, which you can run on any of the x86 hardware. But still it was uh, VM based, so it was virtual machine based and the most commonly used open source uh, platform for VNF hosting is OpenStack, right? And now after VNF came CNF, which is cloud native network function, right? So uh, a container native network function, right? some people call it that way also. So in CNF, uh, what happened? I mean, these uh, virtual network function, which were like VM based, they were kind of converted into container based. Now in this uh, BNF and CNF uh, transition, what happened, uh, I'm coming back to my previous slide, uh, the conversion from BNF to CNF is very long. I mean, it is very, not very straightforward and everyone knows if I have to uh, convert a monolithic application to uh, microservices based application, I have to do, sometime entire rewrite of the application and in in telco world this becomes even more difficult because uh, performance is one of the key criteria right so so there is longer life longer cycle of vnf to cnf conversion right second is uh, cnf is still evolving so as of today uh, it's not like uh, 5g core is 100 percent cnf there are still some vnfs present there and even if we manage to convert entire 5G core into CNF, the 4.5G or the LT advance is going to be there for a decade or more, right? Because 5G, the way uh, right now things are happening, right? You, we have uh, 3G and 4G both, and 3G is kind of getting phased out now, where 5G is already rolled out, right? So, so what is going to happen for next, uh, several years, we are going to have both. So we are going to have uh, LT advance as well as uh, 5G. That means VNF, which were introduced in, in LT advance, will still be there and we have to manage VNF, right? We cannot have CNF in LT advance, right? And uh, last point is that uh, Kubernetes is still adopting to telco specific requirement. So there is a, in CNCF also we have a dedicated uh, telecom uh, user group, right, uh, which is focusing on uh, this kind of work, right. So the key message here is that uh, having a world where only CNFs are present uh, is not going to happen very soon, right. There will be VNFs and CNF both. Now, uh, I have briefly covered this slide, uh, but uh, the other message from this slide is that right now, there is no single hosting platform for VNF and CNF both, right? So if I want to host VNFs, I have to go with uh, OpenStack, right? And if I have to host CNF, of course, I mean, there, there are multiple options. I'm just covering open source based option. So if I have to host uh, CNFs, I will have to go with Kubernetes, right? But will it be, uh, I mean, it will be really good if uh, Kubernetes itself can become a single hosting platform. So is it really possible to use Kubernetes to host both VNFs as well as CNFs. In other words, what are, what we are saying is, can Kubernetes host uh, my containers and my virtual machine inside containers, right? So, I mean, it's like uh, reversing the way things were done. So earlier you were running uh, container on top of virtual machine. Now we want a virtual machine to run inside uh, containers. Okay, coming to next challenge in terms of MEC platform. So right now we don't have single MEC platform. MEC stands for multi-access edge computing, right? So in MEC, you have all kinds of scenarios, right? So in MEC, if it is for private uh, network, you will have VNFs to be deployed, right? And if it is for, let's say, uh, for enterprise applications and edge kind of deployment, let's say far edge deployment, then you will have uh, uh, some virtual machine based application to be hosted or container based application to be hosted. There might be some CNF also from private network perspective, right? So MEC is going to have a mix of all. So MEC will, MEC platform will have VNF hosted, CNF hosted and 
some third party applications which are either container based or vm based right now uh, there is no native support for virtual machine hosting in kubernetes everyone knows that right uh, so kubernetes is container orchestration platform it was kind of designed and developed for that purpose only right and now if we want to uh, fix these kind of uh, scenarios where we want uh, capabilities for vm and container both so vm hosting can be done with uh, openstack uh, dcn kind of architecture and uh, container hosting can be done with kubernetes but the problem is if i go with two msc platform right uh, then i am kind of increasing complexity for my msc platform management i'm also increasing the cost right so it the real question is can we have just one msc platform that will satisfy both the needs okay so uh, with this uh, let's see what is kubert so kubert helps in uh, answering some of those question so kubert is a cncf sandbox project and this is a logo of kubert uh, it helps in marrying virtual machines and container world and it allows us to run vms inside a pod okay so the the major difference here is what we are saying that it's okay if we are not able to get rid of vm because everyone wants to get rid of vm and come to container world but it's okay if we can't do that what we want to do here in kubert is bring that vm as vm okay so let's say if there is a one windows virtual machine i want to run windows virtual machine inside my kubernetes cluster as is i mean i still want to do remote desktop to virtual machine and do all the operation the way i'm doing right now right but i want the flexibility and benefit of kubert's there right the scalability benefits and the single management benefit so that's objective here in kubert and kubert helps in uh, eventual containerization what is easy uh so eventual containerization is uh, all about uh, cloud native adoption stages right so when some organization is on their cloud native adoption journey there will be uh, let's say percentage adoption where uh, if they have 100 application they will containerized uh, uh, maybe 20 application in the beginning 80 will still run in uh, uh, non container world and so on and they'll keep on increasing this ratio to i mean ideally it will be 100% but if not then it might be let's say uh, 90% on a container and 10% on a virtual machine the traditional way right in this uh, eventual containerization what happens in this journey that you have your uh, virtual machine hosting platform like hypervisor based platform and you have your container platform like kubernetes in parallel right both exist in parallel so uh, the easier way is that uh, we can move vm as vm so while some uh, company is adopting this uh, eventual containerization or cloud native journey they can on the day one what they can do they can simply migrate all the vms right uh, to kubernetes right and and run them as vm okay and then slowly pick up maybe uh, one application at a time right and then uh, try to convert that into microservices try to convert the, those into containers and then get rid of that vm and so on right so that way uh, it's it's possible to uh, remove vm hosting platform even before you are 100% there right so that's one of the key benefit of this concept now uh, from telco perspective because that is what the objective of this session is so what is a kubert role in telcos how does it help so kubert helps in uh, handling a situation uh, uh, see i covered four five problem statements right so it helps in having single compute platform for both uh, vnfs and cnfs and it also helps in single msc platform for uh, application which are either virtual machine based or container based and since you have single platform you can have uniform development experience you have easier management and the best part is uh, you can reuse your kubernetes skills right you don't need to really maintain two sets of skills so that's a benefit now uh, 
let's see uh, how Qubit runs. So I'm not getting into Qubit architecture or Qubit uh, component details and all. I will. I just want to show this uh, from a real action perspective, right? So, so this is a small case study that is based on Acuno Edge Stack project, right? Uh, which is uh, called KNI Kubernetes Native Infrastructure based Edge Stack. In that KNI Edge Stack, we have Qubit integrated, right? So uh, the thing that is mentioned here is OpenShift 4.2, but uh, OpenShift 4.2 is not mandatory. You can use OpenShift open source version, which is called OKD, right? Uh, and that will also give the same result. So uh, objective here is to run Windows, uh, let's say 2012 ISO image, right? We want to run Windows machine on Kubernetes platform, right? And we want to see like if I have a VM based uh, application, right? How do I run that VM based application inside Kubernetes? And why I picked uh, Windows? Because uh, Windows VM is uh, much more complex than uh, Linux one. Linux one is quite straightforward. All right, so what are the prerequisites here? Obviously, we need uh, our Kubernetes cluster up and running, whatever it is. It could be OpenShift, it could be something else, it could be Kubernetes itself core Kubernetes, you need your ISO image that you are going to use. You need uh, internet access to download a uh, few components, like some binaries and all. All right, and then, uh, okay. And you need uh, disk space for holding the Windows image. And let me show you how it is done, okay. So these are the high level steps. Okay, so when someone wants to use Qubit, uh, it comes as an operator, okay? But Qubit alone doesn't really work. I mean, you have to have uh, uh, other surrounding systems for Qubit, okay? Like uh, you need to have CDI, and uh, you need to have Word CTL, you need to have uh, VNC. So uh, Qubit does only one thing, right? It, it helps in, uh, uh, getting your VM uh, kind of provision inside pod, right? But uh, to make that thing happen, you need to have your, let's say Windows ISO image or any Linux image to be there, right? Uh, which will be used for installation. To get that part, we use uh, two things. One is Word CTL, another one is CDI, which is container data import, okay? and uh, then there are YAML file given. There are so many sample YAML file given in uh, Qbert uh, website. And you can, to start with, you can use any of those uh, YAML file uh, related to your use case. Okay, and then modify it uh, according to your needs. And uh, from a space perspective, you need to create a persistent volume, right, uh, which will hold the Windows installation. So the way it happens is, uh, I mean, just for uh, visualization perspective, uh, See, when you get a new laptop and you want to install uh, your operating system, what do you do? You plug your pen drive or a CD or DVD inside it and then you start installation, right? It just boots the server and then you do the installation. You do some parameter configuration and at the end, you will have your Windows up and running. The same thing is done here, right? Now, in this case, what we want, we want that ISO image to be available first, right? As some drive, right? Drive in Windows world. And that ISO image should be bootable. It should run on its own. When, when uh, we want to launch that instance, it should run. And then we will do the configuration using VNC viewer. VNC viewer is uh, one common utility that uh, all of us know about, right? And after that, you install Windows. So now the question is, uh, ISO based installation is something where you have to do some, uh, everything from scratch, right? So is this the only option for VM hosting? Answer is no. Uh, you can as well uh, migrate your existing VM image, which might be in uh, format like QCO2 format or some other format that is also supported, right? So you can bring your QCO2 image here 
and then you don't need to do any installation. It will simply, uh, it's like uh, cloning, right? So that is also supported. So I've taken uh, a bit complicated uh, case. And in this particular case, I'm also using uh, Chef for my storage and Rook operator is also used. Okay, so Chef Rook will also be in picture. Now let's see how we do it. So uh, as I mentioned before, there will be eight steps. First step is uh, configuring the CDI, right? CDI is containerized data importer. So this guy does the image import, okay? So how do we get this uh, image? Okay, let me show you. So uh, I'm showing you the exact command here, right? That you need to run. So if you follow this uh, as is, you will be able to run Windows VM in no time. All right, so first is first command is just exporting the version to get the latest version. Okay, and then you run this uh, CDI operator, right, for that version. And it will run very quickly, it hardly takes a uh, few minutes. And then uh, once your operator is created, you just create the CDI CR. Okay, so this, these two commands are good enough to do CDI configuration. Okay. Now, next one is, uh, moving to next one. Now, uh, we are going to configure Qbert. Right? So, for Qbert configuration, I have taken version 26. So, whatever is the latest version, uh, when you are doing the installation, you can pick the latest version at that time. So, first we create one namespace. Right. So all these commands are being executed inside your Kubernetes cluster, right? So first, and I'm showing OC apply. Now, if you're running it on Kubernetes, you can simply replace OC with kubectl. So you say kubectl apply dash f and give your kubert operator file location, right? And kubert cr location, right? And uh, if you're running uh, this on OpenShift or OKD, then you have to run this security context uh, file also. Right, and again, if you're running root chef, then you have to apply one more file. Okay, now last two steps are not applicable if you're not using, let's say, chef. You might be using host path or something else. Uh, and uh, the if you're not using OpenShift, then uh, obviously security context related setting is also not required. Okay, so with these two steps, uh, first two steps you are done with Qbert uh, setup. Now your CDI is set up, your Qbert is set up. Now you want to upload the image, right? How do you upload the image? For image uploading, uh, you use a util utility called WordCTL, okay? Once again, take the latest version, right? And how do you get WordCTL? Uh, Qbert website has uh, WordCTL utility, right? So you take the same version which you have taken for Qbert. All right, and this is very much the standard process that you follow, right? Just download it and change the execution mode to, I mean, just to plus X and it will be executable. Okay, now, uh, before you run the image upload command, which is wordctl uh, image upload, you need to have the upload proxy URL, okay? Now, uh, how do you get that upload proxy URL? So when you set up uh, CDI, Right in the first step, uh, it will uh, create this upload proxy. Okay, so if you run uh, kubectl get svc get s get services for your kubert namespace, you will get the service created and you will have the IP of that. Right, so you will see uh, upload proxy URL there. Okay, take the IP from there and replace it here. And in this command, you also need to give pvc name. And I am using chef, so I don't need to create pv. Right, because Chef Rook will take care of uh, PV creation based on my storage class. So uh, I'm just giving PVC name here, which is ISO Win 2K12 PVC. Then we say access mode read only many. Then we give some PVC size, 25 GB for being on higher site, but even 15 GB is good enough because typically uh, Windows image is around 10 to 12 GB, so 15 GB is good. And then you give the image path wherever it is present. Right, uh, so in my case, it was present in temp folder, so I gave that path. And then you say insecure flag, okay, and then wait second for 
number of seconds, right? Which second is required uh, so that it does not time out? Because sometimes, based on image sizes, unlike uh, Linux, uh, Windows image sizes are huge. So let's say 14 GB, 10 GB, these kind of image upload runs into several minutes. So by default, uh, uh, this timeout is, I believe, 60 seconds. So if you don't increase it after 60 seconds, it will simply time out. So just increase that to some reasonable number, maybe five minutes, six, 10 minutes, whatever. Okay, so how does this command uh, look like? I mean, what is the output we get? So once you run this command, you get this kind of output. It says using existing PVC and waiting for PVC upload pod to be ready and then uploading data. So the ISO image without uh, extract was like 4.17 GB. So it uploaded 4.17 GB in one minute, 13 seconds. Okay. And what it does internally is it will create two PVCs. One will be uh, with a name that you give win 2k12 pvc or whatever name you have given and one will be with dash scratch so scratch is like temporary space right so it copies actually on scratch folder first and then from there it copies to main folder and then scratch is removed okay so uh, once this part is done your image is uploaded right where is it uploaded it is uh, uploaded to a pod now uh, Coming to uh, the PVC creation, so if you're using Rook, right, uh, with Ceph, then you have to create PVC like this, right, and which is storage class to use, which I'm highlighting in red, uh, that you can find out from uh, kubectl get storage or oc get storage, right, and give that uh, appropriate uh, storage file, storage class. Here. Okay, so let's move on now. With that, what happened? Uh, we got our image uploaded to a PV. Right? Now that PV should be mounted to your uh, pod, right? It should be, that volume should be mounted, right? So what we do there, uh, and before that, uh, we also need Word IO container disk drivers, right? So how do you get Word IO drivers? You simply run either Docker pull command or Podman pull command. Okay. So uh, this is, I believe, some 250 MB to 300 MB file. Right. Uh, so you get this file, and after this, you run. Uh, as I said in the beginning, you can download any of the Windows example file just to uh, play with it, just just to see how it is really working, and. Uh, so I've taken a sample file from uh, Qbert uh, GitHub link. Okay, and uh, then I'm just running that YAML file and it says uh, VMI Windows create. Now what happens, uh, so it has created a VM but it is not uh, up, okay, it is in shutdown mode. So if you run a command kubectl get VMS, oc get VMS, you, you will say running equal to false, right? So to make it, I mean to so so what next step is you need to start the vm right so you run a command word ctl word ctl is your uh, command line interface for all kind of operations okay so to start the vm simply say start vm and give your vm name right vm name is defined inside that yaml file and then uh, it will say it is scheduled to start it will take uh, some time and then after some time if you run oc get vm you will see your sample VM running, okay? And then you will see your, uh, I mean, when you do OC get VMI, VM instance, that will be hosted inside uh, some pod, right? So when you say OC get VMI, it's a sample VM, five minutes, it's running from five minutes, you will see the IP and it, you will see the node also where it is running, right? So with this, uh, your VM is started, now your Windows is still not uh, installed, right? Because we have used ISO file. So ISO file uh, requires installation, right? So how do we do that? So now we will connect to that VM using VNC viewer. So you run this command, word CTL VNC and give your VM name, right? You need to run it from any X terminal like mobile X term or any other software, right? So. Uh, and if you get some error, like remote viewer not found, uh, then obviously you need uh, 
uh, WordViewer installation. Okay, so once your WordViewer is installed, then uh, the VNC will show this kind of output, and this is very much uh, similar to the output that you see on your laptop, right? When you do your Windows configuration for the first time. So after this, obviously, you know all the steps. You just do next and start giving uh, different different steps, uh, different configuration. Okay. Now here, since you're running uh, inside pod and all, you, your keys will not work, right? So you have to use all these tabs, spacebar, and the traditional old way. You have to do this. Okay. And once uh, you're done, it will restart your VM. And there is a nice uh, video also on Qbert website. I have given the link. You can have a look at that video. That video talks about how to use those Word IO drivers, which one is supports, and how to select the right Word IO driver. So all that is given in this website. Uh, you can refer to that. And uh, after successful installation, you will see a screen similar to below, right? Of course, you will not see congratulations message, but yeah, you will see the familiar Windows screen. And you can uh, access it the way you wanted to, where where you are used to use Windows. Now, lesson learned part from this uh, particular setup: one, that uh, putting VM inside a pod results in nested virtualization. In fact, uh, you have to enable nested virtualization, then only it works, right? Hence, it has some performance overhead, right? And uh, Kuber team is working on improving that part. And there are so many features which are work in progress, like uh, in traditional uh, VM world, right? You are uh, you can easily change your CPU memory, right, on the fly. But here it is uh, not allowed till now, right? And next point, the key lesson is that uh, you should run this image upload from master node. So uh, don't run it from any bastion host or other host which is not master. And always use the latest version of Qbert. Okay. Some of the common challenges here. Uh, Rookshap permission issue uh, was there, I mean, which I faced and because of which uh, image was not getting uploaded. Okay. And to fix that, I have already shown, uh, we need to run one script, which is given uh, and then there was some bug related to VNC, due to which uh, whenever I was launching the VM, it was kind of coming and going right away. I mean, so you will see that, yeah, some Windows machine is there, but you will not see that for more than a few seconds. So that was uh, some bug in Qbert and uh, upgrading Qbert helped in fixing this. So upgrading Qbert is very simple job, very straightforward, single command job. So upgraded to latest version and that issue was gone. In fact, that's why I uh, suggest to always use the latest version. Okay, and uh, few, I mean, sometimes this cluster operator also gets degraded, uh, authentication operator, and and you just uh, need to fix that so that you don't get this no root to host error. Okay, these are common challenges. Some of the key takeaways. So Qbert, as you know, it's maturing at very fast pace. So obviously a lot of changes are happening. Things are improving day by day. Some issues are expected. That is fine because it's still, uh, it is not graduated. It is still a sandbox project. But the good part about Qbert is, and that is one thing uh, I would uh, suggest everyone to join Qbert Slack channel. And uh, there we have a uh, lot of people who are, there to respond to your queries almost immediately, right? And I'm also, uh, I also want to recommend this uh, examples website, right? Uh, which has uh, so many example that you might want to try, right? So let's say three different uh, Linux version hosting or five different uh, Windows uh, VM hosting options and also all those examples are already there. A very good uh, documentation and very good uh, Slack channel. Now, the key question is from telco perspective. See, in uh, my previous case study, if uh, you were having, let's say, uh, a QCO2 image, right? In fact, uh, Qbert has a VM migration option also, right? It has 
some condition, but yeah, it, it works. Okay. So you don't need to really do uh, ISO based installation. You can do VM migration. Okay. And uh, from telco perspective, uh, there are some features which are listed on the left, right? You see here. So you need all these features to be available so that we can call it telco ready. So huge page support. Since, since Qbert runs uh, on top of Kubernetes, so uh, some of it are related to Kubernetes itself, right? So whether Kubernetes support that at the first place, if yes, then whether the same thing is now extended till uh, Qbert or not, right? Like SRIO, SRIOV support, right? So it was there in Kubernetes and now Qbert also supports SRIOV, right, with some way. And uh, I want to mention one more thing that uh, in this case study you have seen, I was doing a lot of steps like uh, CDI operator and word CTL and all that. So there is a work going on in parallel, which is called opinionated uh, Qbert, right, where hyperconverged operator HCO is created which is like uh, operator of operators, right? Which will take care of all these operators. Okay, so you don't need to really worry about uh, setting up four different operators and then uh, your final thing comes up, right? So that uh, opinionated uh, Qbert is one thing you can search for and get more details. All right, so coming back to uh, is Qbert telco ready, right? So huge base support, it is there. SRIOV support is also there, CPU pinning, NUMA support, yes, and multi-interface support using multers, it is there. Live migration, uh, work in progress kind of thing where it is supported with some condition. Hot plug, hot plug is uh, the feature where you uh, change your CPU or memory on the fly, right? So that is not there right now. And then another important feature that we are so habitual in uh, virtual machine world, right? In hypervisor world, which is fencing, right? Where if a host, like let's say ESXi host goes down, then your virtual machine uh, automatically moves to other available ESXi host, right? So that node failure, let's say in this case, if my uh, virtual machine is running on worker node one, Right, and if worker node one goes down, what happens to my virtual machine, which is running inside a pod? Will it automatically go to, let's say worker node two and run automatically the way pod runs, right? In fact, expectation is that it should, right? And that's where the Kubernetes benefit comes into picture. So it is partially supported now as of today. And coming to next feature, which is ARM64 support. So it is about uh, running it on, uh, running Qbert on, uh, let's say Raspberry Pi kind of devices. So that is not supported as of now. And the last one is GPU and FPGA support. So this is also a work in progress. And I think this will be the feature which will come up very soon, maybe in next uh, few weeks or uh, very soon actually. So I think it is in final testing phases and all. So GPU and FPGA support will come, okay. So that shows uh, the Qbert readiness from a uh, telco perspective, okay? Now, uh, we can uh, go to questions. So, uh, Christy, awesome. uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for a great presentation. Okay, we'll just go ahead and jump into it. We have a lot of questions, so we'll get to as many as we can here. Um, Robson asks, why, uh, does MEC require VNF and CNF? Please, could you provide examples to clarify this point? Okay, so uh, see, MEC is used primarily for two purposes, right? One is uh, for hosting your applications, right? But in certain cases, one of the form of MEC could be that uh, you want to have your private network deployed, right? Uh, and in, let's say, private 5G deployment, there are uh, three or four different deployment architectures in private 5G, right, where uh, you can have all the setup, everything running at the customer premise, or you can have something running at far edge, and that's where the edge coming into picture, right? So uh, you can have maybe your towers and all set up in customer premise, but your 
uh, the control plane running from far edge, not your core data center, far edge, right? So in those kind of scenarios, you will have, uh, and, and of course that uh, core, which is running at far edge to cater to multiple private networks uh, will be like a core data center, right? But it is outside your core data center. It's uh, served somewhere from far edge. And uh, in that kind of scenario, uh, you will need VNFs and CNFs to be hosted at far edge. Hope that answers. Great. Our next question is from Sergio, and he dropped this in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, what about ACLs and security groups like OpenStack, also multiple interfaces and support? So, I mean, since uh, Kubert related things like VMs runs on top of the uh, Kubernetes, right? So the management part is more or less same as Kubernetes. I mean, so you can use all those management uh, primitives that you use in Kubernetes in Kubert also. There are not much difference actually. Okay, um, Arthur asks, um, might be a silly question, and I know you covered this earlier in your slides, but could you uh, explain again what is a VNF and what is a CNF and what is the difference between the two? <laughs> okay, so uh, the simple example could be a firewall, right? F5, uh, not F5, sorry. Any firewall, Palo Alto firewall or some firewall. So that firewall in older days used to be appliance, right? Uh, you get a device, right, which is kind of black box. You don't know what operating system is running there. Mostly it is some proprietary operating system. And, and you are running some software, of course, which is doing this firewall job. And there is this box, uh, which you just plug into your network and you start using it. So it, it is a black box and appliance that was called physical network function. So network function is any kind of, uh, I would say, uh, I think network function itself is a self-explanatory thing. So it could be router or, and in 5G world in service oriented architecture, there are so many network functions, right? So, uh, so earlier there were physical network function, PNF, right? And then uh, telco world uh, decided that it is not good to be uh, dependent on appliances, right? Because scalability is not possible there. So why not move hardware separately and software separately, right? So then uh, what they did, VNF came, virtual network function, where they extracted the software out of it, okay? And that software was then given as, uh, let's say, OVA file in uh, VMware world, or some image which you can import in your hypervisor, right? And, you have your firewall running, let's say PFSense firewall. It's a, it's a VNF, which is open source. So now that PFSense firewall is not dependent on any specific appliance, right? Uh, you can run it on your laptop also, right? Uh, so as long as you have, uh, uh, of course you need to meet the requirement of network because, uh, because there is heavy throughput requirement and all, but then uh, the, the hardware dependency is removed. Then came CNF. So CNF and VNF is uh, something that we can easily understand. So CNF is a, a container native network function, right? So where instead of using virtual machine based image, why not have some Docker images and all, right? So why not use containers and deploy it inside uh, Kubernetes or some container orchestration platform? So that is CNF. So same firewall, which was coming as an appliance is called PNF. When it started coming as a software uh, image, again image, not something that you do next, next, and so not that one, but the image. Okay, that is uh, PNF. And then the same thing when it comes as the Docker image, that is CNF. So hope that answers. Long answer, sorry. Awesome. <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, this it was from Michael. He also asked this in the chat and in the Q&A. So we saw you both there, Michael. Um, are there any slash many examples of Kubevert being used in production that you could mention, please? Oh, that's a very good question. So right now, uh, the biggest hurdle, I mean, I have already shown the Kubevert readiness from telco perspective. And uh, from telco perspective, the biggest uh, hurdle is performance, right? So uh, if you have worked on telco, area, you will know that uh, 
there is a requirement of faster packet processing, right? And there, so you are already doing nested virtualization, right? So uh, you are running, let's say, there might be cube on cube kind of scenario also, right? Where Kubernetes itself is running on Qbert, right? So uh, in nested virtualization, your performance is affected. Right? So, so in this case, I think the biggest hurdle is getting the telco grade performance, right? And that's where the major work is happening. How to get the telco grade performance? And I would like to highlight that uh, in June end, there was a nice webinar in CNCF on high packet process, uh, faster packet processing in Qbert. I would suggest to look at that. And in terms of production deployment, uh, I think we are get, getting there. I mean, uh, I don't have that information, but in telco world, uh, we are still not there, just because of one reason, which is performance. But uh, I also want to highlight that uh, apart from uh, these uh, faster packet processing kind of uh, CNF, sorry, VNFs, there are some control plane uh, network function, right, which, which really don't require too much of faster processing and all. So Qbert is good for those kind of scenarios and Qbert is good for third party application hosting, but for telco grade uh, packet processing or like uh, the core uh, related thing, uh, it will take maybe few months or uh, more to be there. Okay, <clears throat> Alan asks, uh, is container D planned to be supported? Container D, I have no idea. <laughs> I need to check, but yeah, I can check from Qbert. Uh, and you can also uh, check it from Slack channel of Qbert. Right now, it, it works uh, on Kubernetes. Great. Um, Balaji asks, um, can I install VNF on Kubebird and orchestrate it with CNF running in a K8 cluster? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh, that is the whole purpose that uh, you deploy CNF. CNF deployment is uh, straightforward, right? Uh, you get the Docker image from wherever you can get and just deploy that Docker image using your Kubernetes way. Now, then you get VNF and VNF deployment can be done using Qbert. So then your VNF and CNF both will be hosted in same k cluster. All right, uh, Randy asks, can you run an OVA image to instantiate a VM? Yes, so VA image based migration is supported, yeah. So we can do, uh, let's say uh, one image is running on your uh, hypervisor and there are two, three formats that are supported. I need to check the documentation. I, want to, I don't want to make generic comment here. But uh, QCO2 image is certainly supported and ISO image is supported. OVA uh, can be migrated, right? So from VMware world, we can migrate OVA file from, so there is a migration process basically. That is, that is supported. Okay, great. Um, uh, Robson asks, um, in step three, the image upload, this is a Docker image. Is this a Docker image or a regular VM image? Okay, so in image upload, I am uh, I was using ISO image, which you can get from Windows uh, Microsoft website, the normal ISO file. Uh, but uh, so it is not Docker image uh, and not OVA nothing. It is ISO image. But uh, ISO is not the limitation. As I said, uh, you can have a, uh, uh, QCO2 image also, or you can, uh, in fact, migrate your VM as is from your source. And that image is uploaded there. Okay, great. Uh, Bala asks, um, how are the network challenge, how are the network challenges taken care when running hybrid workload with Windows and Linux? Does it use different CNI for both workloads? No, no. So, in fact, uh, this multis CNI, right, which is used for multiple interface support and which is one of the requirement in Telco world, which is same. I mean, multis CNI is, uh, multis network plugin is used. Uh, so, there's no separate uh, plugin for Windows or Linux. 
in fact most of the things at kubernetes remain uh, kubernetes label remains same it runs on top of kubernetes okay um how is def how is defined the number of containers and the hardware resources involved in this vm implementation Okay, so I think if uh, I understood the question correctly, uh, it's about like, how do we do the capacity sizing, right? How do we know what should be the CPU or memory? So uh, if that is the question, then answer is, uh, you just go with uh, your source side setup, right? Uh, so if your source has, let's say, uh, 8 GB memory and uh, whatever, 8 core CPU, then you can use 8 GB memory and 8 core CPU here. And obviously, uh, it looks very much higher si on higher side uh, from container perspective, right? But uh, that is how these VM runs, right? They they are more resource intensive. All right. Um, Pani asks, uh, do we have a sample performance data on? percentage of overhead of VM running in a pod versus running natively as a CNF? No, no, that as far as I remember, no, I haven't seen. Okay, and we got your question mark in the chat and also in the Q&A here. It says, uh, you mentioned nested virtualization. A pod is not virtualization, it's simply a set of namespace gates that constrain visibility of resources. Combined with C groups, which gate resource allocation, you have pods and containers, Linux processes. Where does nested virtualization come into play? Are you assuming that the pods are actually hosted by the VMs? So nested virtualization comes uh, when you get uh, uh, your VM running inside pod, because for running VM, you need uh, KVM kind of thing, right? So. Uh, Qbert also relies on KVM. So KVM, Liberty, everything is there. Those daemon run inside pod. Right? For every single VMI instance, you will have your KVM instance also. And that requires uh, one uh, nested virtualization parameter to be enabled. Okay. So, Keep moving here so we can get the last few in. Um, Randy asks, uh, can you elaborate on the performance issues slash requirements with telco apps? Okay, so one of the uh, performance thing is uh, faster packet processing, right? Uh, so SRIOV support or huge page support, all these are uh, steps towards uh, getting into that stage where we get uh, uh, telco grade, uh, career grade performance. Right? So SRIOV support also helps in that, but since uh, Sorry, uh, since uh, you are not running it directly the way you are running it in uh, bare metal and all, you're running it through, I mean, you're passing through Kubernetes, right? So that's why it is not, uh, uh, it is having those uh, performance issues. Even, even you will, you can note that performance issue even when you run a simple Windows machine, right? So when you run the Windows machine and you try to operate it, uh, you will feel the difference. I mean, it will not be as, uh, your experience will not be as same as what you get in, in uh, some other uh, hypervisor world. Right? So, and and as, as as I said in my session that uh, it is okay to run, uh, let's say third party application which are still relevant to let's say MEC, okay, not not VNFs, uh, but MEC apps, they can be executed, right? Because performance is not the criteria all the time. Right, uh, in all kind of, so it's not, telco is not all about uh, faster packet processing. Right? There are telco applications or MEC application which, which do not require faster packet processing. That, that part is already done by UPF and all. So, yep. All right, and we have time for just one more question here. Um, can you resume all the software we need to run the solution beyond the Kubernetes cluster? Is it possible to migrate Hyper-V VM running to the solution? Uh, okay, so I would say for, so two parts to this question, what are software is required? So I would say uh, just look into uh, 
QBird documentation or look into GitHub page for opinionated QBird where you don't really need to worry about CDI and word CTL and everything because those are already taken care. Those are already merged uh, and you can do that very easily this installation part and uh, Second part the Hyper-V based uh, migration. So I know that uh, very recently uh, it has started supporting migration from VMware world which is not Hyper-V it is ESXi based but Hyper-V, I'm not sure. Uh, it supports a VMware-based uh, hypervisor VM migration. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, everyone, um, for attending this webinar. Thank you to Abhi for the presentation. Um, Abhi, is there a place that um, maybe you want to go back to your slide that has the Slack um, information for Kubevert? Just for folks, we can display that last year. Perfect. Awesome. So feel free to connect. Um, offline here with Abby um, on Kubevert. I'm sure he would love to answer more of your questions than I know there were a lot. We tried to get to as many as we could today. Um, a friendly reminder that the uh, recording and the slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinars page. That's cncf.io slash webinars. Um, we hope to see you at a future CNCF webinar. And thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you, Vishy. Bye. Bye.